ще започна да... Така, ще повторя това. Значи, уважаеми колеги, мога да открия на български, защото всички слушатели е, сме говорящи, български говорящи, как, както виждам. Е, приятно ми е днес да е, обявя, че ще имаме семинарен доклад от нашия нов колега е, Петър Илиев. Е, Петър е, е от е, това лято. Е, член на секцията, да, да, от края на лятото члени на, на секцията по алгебра и логика към е, нашия институт и е, това е неговия първи е, така е, пълнометражен доклад, е, ако не броим е, е, краткото му експозе за е, ставане, нали, за, за участието му в е, конкурса за главен асистент. Е, е, така че давам думата на Петър. Там технически въпрос. Значи презентацията ми е на английски, готвих за английски. На английски ли да говоря или на български? Uh, Петър, Няма... имаш, съдейки по състава на участниците, свобода да избираш, uh, както ти е по-удобно. Както смяташ, ще бъдеш разбран по-добре. Ако се затормозяваш да симултантно да прехвърляш терминологията от един език на други, разбира се, че можеш да, да, можеш да, да останеш и на английски. Ако, ако не, нали, не както, както предпочитеш. Добре, само да шерна скрина и да ми кажете дали всичко е. Значи аз, съдейки по, да, по, по темата, по математиката в доклада, тя е достатъчно нетривиална, така че нали, може би няма смисъл да в, в движение да прехвърляш терминологията, ако не ти е позната на български. Добре, значи виждате ли може и така. екрана? Сега виждате ли го? Аз виждам, да. Добре. Okay. Чудесата на техническите средства. Един момент нещо ми много. Виждам включително движението на мишката, която. А, добре, пък. Която... Добре, чудесно. Да. Откарахме. Така, значи. Uh, the talk is based on these two articles. The first one is joint work with Philip Bobiani, Andreas Herzig, and David Fernandez Duque. And the second one is a very recent article. I submitted it in the beginning of September. And, uh, I have been told that uh, there are going to be people in the audience who do not work in model logics. And uh, uh, that's why I thought uh, the polite thing to do is to begin with a very brief introduction to the language and the cryptic semantics of model logic. And yeah, uh, before we start, uh, I should not forget to say, uh, do interrupt uh, if you have questions. Okay. So uh, we have the usual unary model language, uh, which consists of the formulae they are built starting from a countable set of propositional symbols. And then you have the usual negation, disjunctions, conjunctions, and boxes and diamonds. Now, you use this language uh, to talk about uh, Kripke frames, but uh, this name is just a historical fact. Uh, it's actually, we're using this language to talk about directed graphs. So whenever I say Kripke frame, just think about directed graph and everything will be fine. So uh, we use this language to talk about directed graphs, but uh, we talk about directed graphs in two very different ways. The first way we can use this language to talk about directed graphs is through the notion of truth of a formula in a pointed Kripke model. So given a Kripke frame, which is nothing but a directed uh, graph, uh, we define Kripke models by assigning a set of propositional symbols to every point in the graph. And then we de define the the semantics uh, in this model in the usual way. I'm not going to give the formal definition. Uh, I think some intuitive explanations are enough for the purposes of this talk. Possibly the unfamiliar operators are the box and the diamond. Uh, intuitively, you when you see a box, you should read everywhere you go from the current point in one step along the arrows coming out of it. And when you see a diamond, it simply means somewhere you go from the current point in one step along the arrows coming out of it. And what you have here is a 
Klipke model, if you consider point one, you see that this formula is true in point one in this Klipke model. And uh, intuitively, this formula says everywhere you go out in one step along the arrows, starting from this point, and this is this thing, and point, point two and point three, you see a point that satisfies the proposition P2, obviously true. And then it says that you can make one step along the arrows starting from, P, starting from the point one and reach a point where P1 is true. Here is this point P2. And then you can make one step along the arrows starting from point one and reach a point where not P1 is true. Here is this point. And similarly for the rest of the points, uh, there is no need to do this any further. Now, the next concept uh, you should uh, know about the purposes of this talk is the concept of validity. Now, validity uh, of a formula in a Kripke frame uh, basically means truth in every possible pointed Kripke model based on the frame. In other words, a formula is valid uh, if and only if it is true in every point in every possible Kripke model based on the frame in question. Here is an example. Uh, P1 implies diamond P1 is valid on this reflexive plane. Okay. Then uh, the next concept you should know about is the concept of frame definability. And uh, it simply says a model formula defines a class of frames if and only if it is valid on all, frame, on all frames in the class and not valid on any frame not in the class. Here is an, again this example. P1 implies diamond P1 defines the class of reflexive frames because it is valid on every reflexive frame and it is not valid on any frame that is not reflexive. And uh, we're slowly reaching the central notion of the talk, and it is the saltist, the notion of saltist formula. But uh, before that, uh, a useful abbreviation um, for a natural number greater or equal to zero, this expression here, a box to the, uh, a box to the uh, degree of K or diamond to the uh, degree of, of K phi is simply an abbreviation of this point. You have uh, uh, to the power of K is just a stack of K boxes and uh, diamond to the power of K is just a stack of K diamonds, that's all. And here is the frightful definition of a saltist formula. A saltist formula is a model formula that looks like this, has this general shape, and it uh, fulfills the following conditions. All these formulae, size and, uh, and uh, the chi's in English pronunciation, I think the, the Greek ones are C and K, uh, do not contain the implications. Uh, additionally, uh, negation signs can appear only in front of propositional symbols in the psi's, whereas the chi's do, do not contain any negations. So you, you have no negations in the, in, in, in the chi's. Then uh, in any one of the psi's, you do not have a sub formula that looks like this. You probably, uh, you have a disjunction in the scope of a box. And uh, one of these, thetas, either theta one or theta two contains a propositional symbol P that is not preceded by negation. This is absolutely forbidden. So you don't have a, a positive occurrence of the propositional symbol P in some formula like this in the size. And then you do not have an occurrence of sub formula of this form box and uh, in, in, in the scope of the box, you have a diamond theta where theta contains a propositional symbol not preceded by a negation sign. This definition is uh, from the classic model logic textbook by Chagrov and Zakharyaschev, and it is uh, given us in, in the statement of theorem 1030 in that book. Okay, so we come to the motivating question for the talk. Motivating the actual motivation for the two articles on which this talk is based uh, comes from this paper by Professor Dimitri Vakarel. And uh, here he is on the cover of the journal, The Metagribologist. I confess that I had to look up this word. 
And it turned out that it comes from old French and uh, metagrobologist simply means a person who is a specialist in the studies of puzzles. Okay. So here is, is a simple example of this whole class of motivation, motivating questions that come from this article by Professor Bacanello. So consider this property that is called CR4. For the specialists uh, in modern logic, this is the general church, generalized church Russell property, which basically means that uh, you have for every point, if this point in the frame, if this point is connected to four not necessarily different pairwise, different y's, y, y1 to y4, then you know that there must be a point z such that all these y's are connected by an arrow to this point z. So this first order condition is definable by both these formulae. The first one that contains two different propositional symbols. Now, when I say two different propositional symbols, I, mean, uh, I do not mean the occurrences of these symbols. Now, every one of these two different propositional symbols can occur as many times as you want, but actually you don't meet anywhere uh, P through, for example, here. So uh, this formula is, contains just two different propositional symbols. And then you have another formula that defines the same class of frames. And this time this formula contains three different propositional symbols. Now, the first formula is not a Southwest formula because uh, one of the forbidden conditions, you have a, for example, a box. And in the scope of this box, you have a disjunction of, in, and in this disjunction, you have a positive occurrence propositional symbols. You have actually three such subformulas. So the first formula is not a Southwest formula, the second one is. And now uh, Professor Vukarello conjectured that there is no Southwest formula with two different propositional variables that defines this class of frames. And he conjectured this in 2003. And uh, so we started working on this conjecture with uh, Philippe Bobiani. Andreas Hertz and David Fernandez Duque. And uh, we decided to generalize it a little and the easiest possible, the easiest possible way we thought of generalizing this conjecture is to say the following. The class of frames that satisfy this condition is definable by the Southwest formula that looks like this with two to the power of n minus one different propositional variables, but there is no Southwest formula with at most n different propositional variables that defines this class. Now, uh, now note that Professor Vukarello has actually proved that there, there is a formula with n different propositional variables that defines the class, but this formula is not a Southwest one. <laughs> and uh, so the tools to attack the the tools to attack the question. This problem uh, we, developed, uh, to, uh, we developed uh, for the attack of this question. Um, we did uh, we developed them in this article, joint work with Andreas, Philip, and David. But we couldn't solve Professor Vukarelov's problem then in this article. We did something else in it. And uh, I am going to explain shortly what we were able to show in the article in this joint article. But uh, now let's go to the main idea behind the definition of the tools needed to solve this problem. So the general idea actually for attacking such problems comes from uh, Boolean function complexity. And uh, the earliest paper I could find in which this idea was formally stated and made precise is this one, but uh, from 1993, but keep in mind that uh, uh, similar arguments were used probably starting from the 50s, the previous century. And uh, roughly speaking, the same idea was probably independently discovered in 2003 for in the context of first order model logics. And by model logics here, I mean probably conceived to include temporal logics like CTL and CTL plus and things like that. 
So uh, this idea was independently discovered uh, for first order logics in this paper by Adler and Imaman. And uh, in this paper, it was used to improve on earlier results on lower bounds and converse in model logics for the city of actually last model logic. Uh, and these previous results were obtained with the help of, help of automata theoretic techniques, but uh, Adler and Imaman improved these bounds without using any automata. Now, what is the basic idea behind the tools that we are going to use? Uh, instead of formally considered as a string of symbols, the idea is to work with their parse or syntax trees because uh, this gives you a more geometric and visual grip on the structure form. And here's a an example of a syntax tree of a model formula. And this is the syntax tree of the box and uh, diamond P formula. And it's obtained in the usual way. There is nothing to explain here. Now, uh, if we are given two sets of pointer Kripke models, and uh, suppose we are given a model formula phi, such that this model formula is true in all the pointed models in the set M, and it is full in all the false in all the pointed models in the set N, then it is known that there is a specific recursive labeling of the syntax tree of phi that looks like this. And uh, basically, intuitively speaking, uh, uh, the labeling is defined in such a way that uh, we assign pairs of sets of pointed Kripke models to each node of the syntax tree by uh, simply following the semantics of the formula. I will explain shortly what, what I mean by this. But uh, the root of the tree is assigned the pair MN. And uh, because phi is true in all the pointed models in M and false in all the pointed models in M, uh, we assign uh, to the syntax tree of the formula, uh, to, to every node in this syntax tree, we assign a pair of pointed models OP that are obtained from M and N respectively in a specific precise way, such that the, every formula that starts at a given node, for example, this sub formula of psi, is true in all the pointed models on the left of the node and false in all the pointed model on the right of the node. Now, in, instead of giving you the uh, general definition, which at first sight can glance can seem absolutely frightful and incomprehensible, I, I will give you a small example and I think this will, this example will make things transparent. Now consider again the formula box P and diamond P. And then we're given a pair of point models uh, where the proposition P is true only in the black nodes in these point models. Uh, now, obviously this formula box P and diamond P is true in the pointed model on the left, this one that consists of the Kripke model G and the point denoted by the triangle here. And it is false. This formula is false in these two pointed models here that are formed with respective, from the respective uh, frames and the point denoted by the triangles here. Now, what we do is the following. Well, uh, we put the pointed model in which the formula is true on the left of the root of the syntax tree of the formula, whereas the two pointed models in which the formula is false are placed on the right of the root of the syntax tree. So this is your first initial step. Then, because the whole formula is false in the two pointed models uh, on the right of the root of the syntax tree, and because the whole formula is a conjunction of two sub formulae, we should consider uh, the reasons why this formula is false in the, these two pointed models here, these two. And uh, the reason is because the subformula box P uh, is false in the pointed model based on the H frame, on the H frame here. And why it is false? Because you can make starting from this point denoted by the triangle, you can make one step along the, the arrows and reach a point that does not satisfy P. Uh, so we place this pointed model on the right of the root of this sub tree 
that represents the subformula box P. And uh, similarly, we place the pointed models based uh, the pointed model based on the I frame here. We, apply, we place it here on the right of the root of the subtree that starts with the diamond key. Now, because the box P and uh, diamond P are both true uh, in, in this pointed model, we put this pointed model on both uh, on the left side of both these two subforms. Okay. And uh, we continue in this way. Now we consider why this subformula, as I said before, is false in this pointed Kipke model. Well, as I said, it is false because starting from here, you can make one step along the, the arrow and reach a point that does not satisfy P. That's why you put this pointed model now that consists of the frame H and uh, the point designated by the triangle on the right of this literal and you put the witness to the fact that this pointed model satisfies P on the left. Similarly, you do the same thing here. And basically that is how you obtain the labeling of the syntax tree of this form. And we go back to the motivating question now, when you know this labeling. Now, now how do you, do you use this type of ideas to prove that there is no Southwest formula two different propositional symbols that defines the class of frames that satisfies this CR4 uh, condition. Well, uh, one way to deal with this is given in this recently submitted article, and uh, it is as follows. We can try to construct uh, two sets of frames, M and N, such that all the frames in M satisfy the CR4 condition. No frame in N satisfies the CR4 condition. And obviously, uh, every formula that defines CR4 will be valid on every frame in M and not valid on any frame in N. Okay? So for every frame in N, there must be a falsifying pointed model based on that frame. Let uh, this bold N be the set of falsifying pointed models. So clearly, we have that all the pointed models in this set will satisfy not five. Then let us pick a point, a set of pointed models M based on the frames in M because these, all of these frames satisfy the CR4 conditions. We will have that phi will be true in all these pointed models. And because phi defines this CR4 condition, must be able to apply this labeling to the syntax tree of this formula phi so that the property I talked about earlier is preserved. Obviously, the trick here, the big fight, is to construct such sets of frames M and N so that no matter what the set N of FI falsifying pointed models is, we can pick a set of pointed models M for which we can prove that we cannot apply the label to the syntax tree of a surface formula that contains most two different variables and that defines the condition CR4. Uh, the difficult step is the construction of such classes of frames and to prove that we cannot preserve the property of the labeling is often given as a suitable combinatorial game. And we defined such a combinatorial game in our joint paper with uh, Philippe Andreas and David. Uh, however, uh, I presented here the ideas uh, not in terms of combinatorial games, but in terms of labeling of syntax trees, because in this way, we don't have to talk about the games, winning strategies, uh, related notions, which would have made the presentation unnecessarily long. Uh, just for the specialists uh, in the audience, uh, this combinatorial game can be, um, it's actually an extension of the classic Aaron Floyd Fessé games uh, applied to the model context. And uh, the extension is uh, tailored so that we can uh, reason not only about uh, the depth of nesting of quantifiers or model operators, but about the number of disjunctions, conjunctions, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we, we had to construct frames 
falsifying frames for these C4 properties in order to solve the Professor Bakarov's problem. And uh, here is one falsifying frame. This frame does not have the CR4 property. Why? Well, uh, if you consider the arrows coming out from this point zero here, so this point zero is connected to four different points, one, two, three, four, but there isn't, there isn't a single point here among this one, such that all one, two, three, and four are connected to this point. Now, a few words about uh, this point, these uh, frames. Uh, all these points, one, two, three, four, and one A, two A, three A, four A are reflexive points. So you have loops here, but I haven't drawn them not to clutter the picture. This is the only point, this is the only point in the graph that is not reflexive, so you don't have a loop here. And this uh, dashed line symbolizes the fact that the relations, the relation restricted here to 1a, 2a, 3a, and 4a is actually a relations of equivalence. So it's a reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Now, uh, because this uh, frame uh, does not satisfy the CR4 condition, there must be a, a falsifying pointed model based on it. A, a falsifying pointed model for every formula that defines this CR4 condition. We do not know what these falsifying pointed models are or how they look, but we uh, can prove about such pointed models that they possess uh, nice properties. And one of them, one essential uh, property of these pointed models is that uh, these, any such falsifying pointed model should be uh, based on the o, uh, on zero point here, first uh, condition that these pointed models satisfy, and then all these point, all these point, uh, points here, 1a, 2a, 3a, 4a, must satisfy different subsets of propositional symbols. These are the nice conditions. So there are some more nice conditions that these pointed models should satisfy, and new models should satisfy, but uh, we are not going to go into this. Now, we have, we have a falsifying frame. Now we have to come up with uh, frames that uh, possess this property. Here are some nice frames. And these frames are basically just like the previous one, the falsifying one, but in these frames, uh, the step from zero to one is missing. Here, the step from zero to two is missing. And these frames do satisfy the property C4. Uh, again, uh, we have another similar frames that satisfy the property C4. This time, the uh, relation step from zero to three is missing, and the relation step from zero to four is missing. Okay, then we need some more point, um, some more frames. In this, uh, this time, uh, we have one additional relation step starting from one to one A, and then we have here an additional relation step from two to two A. And similarly for these frames. Now, when you have these frames, you can form a pointed model based on all these frames that simply mimic the valuation of the falsifying frame by mimicking the valuation uh, in the falsifying frame. I, I simply uh, if point one in the falsifying frame satisfies uh, a given set of uh, propositional symbols, then the same is true about point one here, and point one here, and similarly for the rest of the points. Okay, and when you have, now the proof proceeds along the following lines. If phi is a model formula that uh, contains not more than two different propositional variables, and that is true in these point models, and is false in this pointed models, then we can label the syntax tree of T phi as described. However, we can show that in order to label it as described, then the syntax tree of the formula phi is not the syntax tree of the southeast point. The general result, uh, however, look uh, slightly more frightening. And uh, they're as follows for any n greater or equal to two. There is no southeast formula containing n different propositional symbols that define CR2 to the power of n. Then we have that CR2 to the power of n cannot be defined by a model formula with n different propositional variables that contains only boxes or only diamonds. 
that is every formula is not more than n different propositions or variables that defines here uh, the church, the generalized church Rossi condition has alternation depth at least two, which means that you have either a diamond in the scope of, of a box or a box in the scope of a diamond. And then if you consider the um, implication free uh, language, if phi contains not more than n propositional variable, and uh, then any such formula contains at least two to the power of n minus one occurrences of disjunctions, and the combination of a and minus one conjunctions in the scope of a diamond, which is in the scope of a box, occurs at least two to the power of n times in any such phi. Uh, you have more results of this type uh, in this article, and uh, they are as follows. Now for any m and n greater or equal to zero, this formula is essentially an optimal model formula defining this first order property whereby r to the power of n is simply the n-fold composition of the relation. Similarly, here this is the n-fold composition of the relation. I know that this result uh, applies to uh, classic ax model axioms like the one for the transitivity, reflexivity, and the density. And then you have uh, another result of this type that says the Lyot axiom is an optimal model formula that defines transitivity plus here we're talking uh, careful. Now we're talking about second order properties of converse well-foundedness. So this result is slightly more difficult to obtain. And then we have this formula, and to, for this formula, we have that it is optimal among those defining reflexivity plus transitivity. So you don't need to take the conjunction of the T and four axiom. This one is for the model logicians. And then you have this formula is optimal among the model formula that defines symmetry. Another one for the specialists in model logic, uh, uh, as is known, the property of a graph being non encolorable can be defined in a model language with the universal and box diamond. And with respect to this uh, language and this property, we have uh, the following upper bound. For every n, there is a formula in the language with the universal and box diamond uh, that is uh, roughly of this length that defines non and colorability. And we were able to provide a law bound that says that basically roughly um, logarithmic number of variables are necessary, but we were unable to show a matching law bound for the length of the formula. So our law bound for the length of the formula is linear. So here's one open question. Uh, and then we come to the open problems with respect to this work. Uh, this work. Uh, we have many open problems. I'm going to give you some, but this list is very, very, very far from being exhaustive. Uh, in a sense, uh, when you consider the result that I was able to obtain uh, about the Professor Vickrell's conjecture, I wasn't able to show that we need n minus one different propositional variables in order to have a Salkis formula that defines CRN. Um, that is my result from one point of view seems weak because it says that uh, we do not have Salkis formula in language with log n different propositional variables that define CRN, but the gap between log n and n minus one is exponential. So bridging this gap is in some ways wide open. Uh, to make the matters worse, in the meantime, Professor Vickrell has conjectured that adding the backward looking modality can lead to an exponential decrease of the number of variables needed to define some certain frames. So this conjecture is open. And then we have another difficult open one, uh, which is the following uh, question. Are the popular lemon scott axioms optimal among those defining this first, this first order condition? This is classic material from other logic textbooks. And um, here we come to the infamous one. Uh, I couldn't uh, resist uh, sharing it with you, um, especially because we have specialists in temporal logics here. So uh, this thing has been open for decades. 
and uh, judging by the rumors, in the rumors, uh, a considerable number of very smart people have failed to resolve the question. So uh, if anyone is interested in this, I am ready to talk about this thing, but uh, what I can offer actually is here is just a history of, and an explanation of my failed attempts to resolve this question. And the question is, can we prove or disprove that there is an exponential succinctness gap between the linear, the linear temporal logic with non-strict until and linear temporal logic formulated in the language with a strict until operator? What this means intuitively, uh, and I will briefly explain this and I will finish with the talk. Uh, this is just a qu quick intuitive explanation uh, of a small instance of the general problem. So this is not the full general problem. Uh, but it is enough for the purposes of the presentation. Now, uh, one very simple way of modeling our uh, thinking about uh, the future, and this is our everyday naive every, uh, intuition about the future, is to think about uh, time as consisting of discrete moments. And we can model this with the help of the natural. So here, the dotted line here, uh, symbolizes the natural numbers. And this formula uh, in the future phi is true, means that in a moment in the future, and this moment is, is different from the present one, there is a point where phi will become true. So we're actually uh, interpreting the future uh, with the help of the natural numbers and the strict linear order of the natural numbers. However, uh, people working in uh, formal verification of software find it more convenient to interpret it this modality in the future phi is true actually in the following way. When you say in the future phi is true, you either mean that phi is true in some future time that is different from the present or phi is true now at the moment of speaking. So this is a different interpretation of the same modality. So basically, you have the obvious that uh, this non-strict future is equivalent to either phi is true now or is true in the strict future. Okay. And uh, if you want to know more about this problem, you can read more about it in this article, uh, but uh, don't get confused. Uh, the problem does not appear first in this article from 2005, it, it appeared a long time ago before that. And the conjecture is that there is an infinite sequence of formulae in the language with the non-strict future. And these, uh, the lengths of these formulae grow linearly in the indices of the formulae, such that any sequence of equivalent formulae with the strict future, uh, the lengths of the equivalent formulae grow exponentially in the indices of the formulae. In other words, you don't have a sub-exponential sub equivalence preserving transi uh, translation from uh, the language with the non-strict future to the language with the strict future. Uh, I conjecture that there is, uh, there is no such equivalence sub-exponential translation from these two languages. And one such sequence that witnesses to this fact is this one, but I have been absolutely unable to prove this conjecture and keep in mind that uh, uh, what I'm using here is an infinite number of variables to define these formulae. So it, I don't know whether uh, a finite variable fragments of the non-strict future language, uh, whether you have a, a sub-exponential uh, equivalent preserving translation to the language uh, with uh, the strict future, if we're talking about uh, finite variable fragments of linear temporal logic. And basically, that's all. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have we have ample time for questions and comments. Thank you, uh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, so the it's now the turn of the audience. Uh, are there questions? Are there comments? Now, th this is a, a strictly specialized thing, uh, but uh, it, it is 
it is connected to the general problem of proving lower bounds on, on resources. And this one is, is familiar to, to computer scientists. Uh, basically, every problem that is connected to proving law about on some type of resource uh, like um, time or space is in a sense connected to, to this type of problems mm -hmm. and proving such impossibility results is difficult in the boolean setting while the model setting it is still possible to obtain meaningful results some publications so you still have some low hanging fruits there but uh, in the boolean setting is practically a no-go area Nowadays. Okay, so if, if there are no questions, I have comments I, I, uh, about, about the uh, last few slides where you yeah. uh, moved to, to <laughs> discussing KOTO. Yeah. So, uh, so there seems to be something about the way you count uh, uh, the that is uh, the way you measure the size of the formulas that you get to when establishing the su succeedness gap. It's actually not your result, but is it? Is it? Yeah. Uh, well, well basically, you, you count the number yeah. of nodes in the syntax tree of the formula. This exactly. Is and uh, uh, if you count uh, different subformulas, then if you count different subformulas, then it's still widely open, but. Uh... Uh, it's even more difficult. Uh, because if you have next, the next modality, uh, that's, which corresponds to a single uh, diamond yes. uh, in the model sense, actually then uh, the, the whole thing is uh, uh, linear in terms of the different number of different subformulas you generate. Uh, because yes. you, yeah, but, and this somehow uh, makes me think of, uh, you know, how, how uh, natural the setting of the, problem is where you only have uh, non-strict and strict uh, future actually you don't have LTO you, you your example was about uh, PTO uh, with the uh, with just the, the box and diamond uh, representing uh, arbitrarily uh, long sequences of, of states uh, le le leading to a P state or a non-P state yeah so the was problem it that? is was the, the full general problem is with the strict until versus the non-strict until Fine. So, I, so, I didn't want to define the strict and non-strict until because it's contradictory. So once you once you define the next, which you can in the in the not in in terms of the strict yeah. until, yeah, and uh, you cannot in the terms of the non-strict no. one. No. When you introduce next to the non-strict case, you get an altogether different picture. Yeah. Of of the, well, so the, the I have many so, failed attempts here too, uh, and the, the, the situation is really miserable. Because you can say if you um, if you're so desperate, you can say okay, let's take the simplest possible setting in which we can hope to prove something like this. And the simplest possible setting you can think of is to define a, a simple version of, of the next operator. And this simple version says today or tomorrow. Yeah. And try to find an equivalent formula in the strict next. So obviously, if you have the strict next, you can uh, define today or tomorrow like uh, P uh, phi or tomorrow phi. It's either today or tomorrow. Try to prove lower bounds on the size of equal formula. And the conjecture there is that there is a, a quadratic gap between the sizes. Mm. But even this is open. Even this cannot be shown. Yeah. But uh, my question is actually, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, switch between the roles of, of the committed mathematician who is uh, interested in the problem as such and uh, somebody from outside who would be interested in the problem only if there are some uh, projections for uh, for the applications so so my my question here is yeah. why why do you want to uh, deprive yourselves of uh, yourself of the next time operator and why do you count uh occurrences of formulas rather than different subformulas okay i, I don't want to, to, to deprive myself of the next operator I, I use this simple example for the purposes of the presentation the I general, see. Okay. The, yeah, yeah the first the next one uh, uh, from the practical applications it depends on the data structure you're using when doing model checking if you're using a data structure that uh, relies on, on the subformula representations basically if you're using temporal circuits 
yeah then uh, you you win space because you can uh, define uh, circuits using very small space by counting different sub formulas but then these things starts to become absolutely incomprehensible for people if you code a property you want to model check as a formula but you compressed it down to a circuit where you count just the the, the different sub formulas and how they are connected to each other but this is um, symbolic model checking bottom up uh, yes but yes, people so who, who, are, who are trying to formulate a, a property that you want to model check usually formulate it as a formula not as a circuit yes and they want every now and then when debugging their software they yes. try to the, write the entire formula yes. which fit yes. it say in yes. say 20 formal, nodes of yes. uh, memory but <laughs> And if you have a formal proof, the power of 20 symbols to, to write. And you need a formal proof that says you cannot do this every time. So people will, will stop trying. Whereas now they don't stop trying. Okay. So, so uh, uh, more questions, more comments? Uh, by the way, uh, one particular function that this talk uh, uh, is to uh, have is uh, the that this is also the uh, report uh, Peter is supposed to give to the department upon the completion of uh, the uh, this uh, year, okay. which is not a full year on his behalf uh, well, as member of the department but uh, it we, we, it, it's like also this. played this uh, this function as well. And therefore, uh, in a couple of weeks, we are to have uh, a less busy uh, day, one, one uh, talk less uh, busy uh, uh, when uh, doing all the other reports, uh, uh, which, which are, so we are supposed to do, we are supposed to give for, for the year. Um, and uh, let's thank uh, Peter again. Thank you. Now I, I, I will stop recording now and we can continue uh, talking uh, uh, whatever language we wish uh, for an informal discussion. Uh, there is one announcement to be made. There will be a seminar uh, next week uh, too. Uh, it will be either me giving a talk with a similar purpose or maybe uh, me and uh, Rusanka Lukanova from our department both of us giving a talk uh, uh, for, for that same purpose. Uh, uh, and it will be, a, in that case, a pair of sh two shorter talks uh, in a sequence. Uh, so um, I will stop recording now.